Welcome to the Big Movement Podcast. If you're ready to create results and make huge strides in your business, finances, personal development, and health, then you're in the right place. Pushing past excuses and powering through procrastination can be a challenge alone. Here, you'll get the support, tools, and knowledge you need to get to the level you desire in your business and life. Let's get started with your host, Byron Ingram. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the podcast today. We have Angie McMillan. She kind of goes by Angie Mack of all these different ways she likes to express herself online. But what she does is she helps entrepreneurs, especially local businesses, resolve their aches and pains through utilizing online marketing so they can reach their ideal clients. Because as we know, in today's world, the best way to reach a client is to connect with them online. So we're going to dive in and see how she helps doing that. So Angie, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Sure. So how did you get into this world of online marketing? Because everyone has a different journey. Oh, absolutely. So I was at home um, on maternity leave with my second son. And I thought, well, why not start a part time business um, teaching a movement modality that I've had the pleasure of knowing for the last 18 years? I've been qualified to teach the method for the last 10 and I thought, well, perfect time to start um, my practice. And in searching for how to market these days, I used to run a dance school, you know, back in early 2000 and we'd just put flyers out. But here's Facebook and, you know, ads for how to start a business cut started coming up and I thought, hmm. I wonder if I could use Facebook ads marketing to market my practice. And of course, then all the wellness coaches came up and I just fell into learning how to market my own practice using online marketing. Oh, excellent. Well, that's a, an intriguing way of doing it because as like I said, everyone has a different journey. But then if you think about it, it just made sense because if you had to turn back the clock to when you had your dance studio and you could just put out flyers, because I think everybody remember those days, like you put flyers everywhere. It didn't really matter what type of business it is. And now if you had to do that, people look you like, really, that's kind of cheap. Mm hmm. <laughs> exactly. Even though if you just turn back the clock a little bit, that was the way to promote something. So now that flyer is an ad on a social media platform. Mm-hmm, exactly. So things change dramatically. So when you decided to dive in to start teaching people online, what was it like? Was it full of frustration in the beginning because you were learning something new or was it like, I've got this, I'm gonna pat myself on the back and just knock this out? <laughs> oh, frustration, absolutely. There's so many techie things that you have to get your head around. And because I was at home with the baby, when the baby was sleeping, I would be jumping on the computer and, right, I have to fix this issue. So whether it's putting your WordPress website together or um, working out Facebook's power editor or what to write on your landing page, <laughs> I was right. getting in there and I fell in love. Like I'm a dancer and a movement person. So it's really strange for me to fall in love with technology in the way I have with online marketing. <laughs> now, that is interesting because sometimes there are different animals where some people are really creative. They look at tech and go, whoa, that scares me. I'm going the other way. But you've embraced it. Mm -hmm. I did. I did. I liked working out the colors and, you know, how to lay out everything in my WordPress site, what kind of, um, so I use a creativity that I have through dance and designing my flyers back in the day, <laughs> but now designing landing pages and websites, so. So what type of creativity was it that you use? Like you imported from the dance world? That I import from the dance world? Yeah, like how did you start to be creative? Um, well, with, when you're uh, teaching educational dance, you're teaching critical thinking skills. So I like to bring that into how I run my marketing as well. So how do, would you say critical thinking skills comes into play? Because some people, I think they're looking at critical thinking, like I don't get it. 
So having a deeper look at understanding what you're actually offering as a service or a product and thinking about the transformation people actually take by buying into what you're offering them and taking them on a journey as they do that. So whether they're coming in as cold traffic, what do they need to know? So that kind of critical thinking, what do they need to know about you, the product? What do they need to know about themselves before they'll actually, you know, put the money forward to buy from you? So that's just like a cold email sequence, obviously. Right. But that's important because you think about how many times what ends up happening, people don't think about those critical things about what their product is, who their audience is, and ultimately, why is it that someone should buy from you versus the plethora of other people out there? Exactly, yeah. Well, people buy from people, they want to know the story behind it. Like you asked me on the podcast first, well, how did I come to online marketing? It's that relationship building and storytelling as well. Right. And that's the thing I think people forget about in the online marketing arena. It's the story. Because if you look at the world that we live in, we're compelled by stories regardless. It doesn't matter if you're looking at picking up a book, there's a story that's involved. If you're watching television, what do people do? They they watch shows that have a compelling storyline to it. So things intriguing. The ones that last for multiple seasons they all have that same thing in common it's a compelling story that caps it like makes you hungry you want more yet when you look at some people who are marketing their business online there's no story it's just like hey i got this come buy it and then they hear crickets <laughs> exactly <laughs> um so so it's just the thing we have to do is begin leveraging stories more Mm -hmm. We do. So I've got a num number of stories I tell in my email sequence when people get on my list through, through um, Feldenkrais and it's related to dance and Feldenkrais and how I learnt to master the breakdance windmill move because I am a B-girl. <laughs> I was, uh, at the time I started Feldenkrais, I was trying to master that move, the one where you're rolling around on your shoulders and you have to whip really fast to get around. Yeah. And my Feldenkrais teacher said to me, go slowly. I'm like, what do you mean? How can you go slow with this move? You need the momentum to get your legs around. But through going slow and taking his advice on breaking the movement down piece by piece, I understood every single part of that movement. So then when I did go fast, I was able to master it pretty quickly. And you know, that in itself was priceless because if you think about when we're learning things, especially in today's online world, people want the instant results. You know, we see people like, they had this massive launch. I want to do that right now, but they don't understand the individual mechanics. So while someone might make something look super easy, they didn't realize that this person had to break down every last component. What's working here? How do I do this? How do I build upon it? So now they can make it look seamless. Like that looks so easy because they did the work to exactly. understand each and every component. Mm. Because the Feldenkrais work is slow, but when you know something slow enough, you can speed it up because you know every single component. Yeah. Right. It, that's just the world we live in. You have to know each individual component. So when you started making that transition to helping businesses promote themselves, what was it like? Was it this big difference that you go from your past career, your background in terms of teaching dance to this online world was it like people are like, but we know you as a dance person. How do you do this marketing thing? <laughs> Actually, it was my Feldenkrais colleagues that approached me and asked me how to do it. So I had a couple of Feldenkrais practitioners I taught online marketing to. And yeah, I have to go slow and break it down for them. <laughs> One um, lady is in her 80s and she's learning online marketing. 
she's retired at the moment so this is her one little job that she's doing <laughs> yeah yeah now, learning uh, how to what... build a campaign but you see that's interesting because you had people approaching you so what was it that you began doing that enabled people to approach you out of the uh, Feldenkrais community? Um, well, I'd just done the end of last year, the last six months of last year, I ran a number of campaigns. I ran four challenges into Facebook groups where I taught live classes. I put out a cheat sheet, an ebook, an email sequence um, to build my list. And one of the other, the last one I ran at the end of the year was to build my membership site. And from that, I had a number of practitioners see my ads internationally and ask me about them. So, yeah, that was pretty great. And so then I um, just emailed my list, I think, once or twice and just said, hey, I'm opening up um, some places to work with me. And yeah. I've got some people asking to work with me. Oh, excellent. And you, know, you did something really important there that you focused on building the community. And I think that's one of the things that so many people forget about. It's we want to jump right into not really having a relationship with someone, but we wanted to jump right in there like, hey, I've got this and you're going to buy it. And you're thinking, I don't even know your name. <laughs> exactly, yeah. The community is essential to, um, yeah, getting big sales, really. <laughs> Having the, not just um, a lot of followers, but then you get the social proof of that community as well. It is, because you think about the world that we live in, it, any time that you're on Facebook, you're going to see ads for all types of products, all types of services. Yet, what people don't realize is that there's different models depending on what you're trying to do. So, for instance, like, let's say someone has a restaurant. You don't necessarily have to build a community before you can start promoting a product to people. Because if someone's hungry and it's you know lunchtime or dinner time and you post an ad that has an appetizing meal and your targeting's correct, like, hey, come on in, save, mention this ad and save 10% off your meal. If someone's hungry, thinking, well, why not? I'll come on in. Because there's a low barrier of trust that's required because they're hungry. It's something that if it's, let's say it's $10 or, or whatever, if it doesn't work it, or it didn't taste that great, it was $10 and they're probably not going to go back. Not that big of a deal. But then... When you're talking to someone to invest, you know, hundreds or thousands of dollars in a program, well, you're not just going to walk and say, hey, this works. You got to buy it. Someone might look at you and go, uh, no, I kind of want to know you first. So that's where the community has to come in. Exactly. Yeah. The no lack and trust factor. <laughs> oh, yes. And I always bring it back to a dating example because everybody can relate to Because sometimes people look at other analogies and wonder, like, I don't get it. But with dating, everyone can visualize. You know, imagine you know if a guy walks up to a woman in the bar, and didn't say anything at all, but the first words out of his mouth was just simply "your place or mine." Exactly, I love that analogy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know what's going to happen? Probably nothing good. You've got to flirt with them first. <laughs> All right, you have to build up rapport and trust. You know, give some compliments. And, you know, some people say, but I, I get that one yes out of, you know, out of 100 people. But that one yes, do you really want that yes there? So, you know, you have to look at us building that community of people that trust you, that know that you're the expert and the person they want to work with. Because here's the interesting thing of how things change. We're no longer in that world where, you being an expert is enough you have to be the most influential yes you do <laughs> because think about it if when you're looking online and it, you know you're gonna see the same type of ads that I, I will do you see like just tons of people that are marketing some type of core or some type of service to you on a daily basis yeah yes every every ad someone's trying to market to me right 
But how many of them are focused on building a relationship instead of just selling something? Mm, maybe about half. Right. And, and that's the world we live in. People haven't caught on to that. They're still into the your place or mine mentality versus mm. build a community. Mm. Yeah, well, that's, um, that's why I love live streaming, because you can build a community very quickly by live streaming. And that's, that's how I've built my community in my right. Mm. Well, it is. So how did you start building your community with live streaming? Because it's something that's extremely powerful. Um, I ran the four challenges last year for Feldenkrais. So I ran two on the pelvic floor because I like working with women mostly. And then lower back pain, um, hips. And then I also ran one for the shoulders and the neck. So inside of the challenge group, I taught lessons over the five day period. And then I've I've now put everybody into just one big Feldenkrais group where I teach um, oh, excellent. times a week. Yeah. And so now so, I'm starting to utilize live streaming on my actual personal page. So I've done a few on my uh, business pages. I've got two, obviously, with Feldenkrais and online marketing. But now I'm branching out into my own personal page to really establish the brand that I want to become. Oh, excellent. All so, that <laughs> well, that's, that's always the thing you have to do. It's <laughs> a brand is evolving because <laughs> if the you brand is evolving it, as I live stream. Yes, <laughs> because well, I am still deciding on what kind of content I do want to present. I have an idea, but I'm just experimenting with them at the moment. Right, but it's, it's something that makes sense. We'll dive back into the challenges in a moment, but I think it's something critical for people to understand. If you're looking at a brand, it's never like it's just molded in concrete where it's not changing. If you look at companies, let's just say like Coca-Cola or Pepsi, some of these big you know, companies that are, are known globally. If you look at their branding over the years, it's continuously evolved and changed. They haven't used the same local for the past 80 years. It There's been different versions of it because the brand evolves as society evolves. The product lineup has evolved because people want different things. It's not, as, it's not always, we have one drink. If you don't like it, too bad. You're going to buy it anyways. It's not like that. So they, it, they have to evolve. Mm, exactly, yeah. And so, I, I also, I don't want to just talk about business as well. If I am evolving myself as a brand, I, I like to talk about my struggles as a business owner and a single parent. So, because I know right. oh, oh, yes. amongst, yeah, because I know amongst my single parent mummy friends, they actually look towards me because I am uh, building a business, you know, building a life that I desire for myself and my family. And they're inspired by that. So I, I understand that I'm actually inspiring other people to do the same. Right. And we're going to dive into that in a moment, but because <laughs> I want to get back into this challenge, like, Oh, got to jump back into this. So okay. <laughs> with the challenges, what did you do to run them? Because some people, they hear these term challenges, like challenges, like, are we talking like a push up challenge or what? So what did you do there? <laughs> Um, so I did the Facebook ad onto the landing page, asked them into the group and I sent an email sequence out during the challenge that backed up the lessons that I was teaching in the challenge. And I went live once a day and taught a 10 minute lesson, which is only part of a much longer awareness through movement lesson. Yeah, so people could watch them later. And I kept the, kept them up in the group, I think, for a month after because a lot of people didn't get to watch them because a lot of people put their health and well-being on the back seat, don't they? Especially as oh, entrepreneurs, yes. when we get busy, we like to think that we can get away with not uh, looking after ourselves <laughs> as well as we could. So but that's for everybody. Life just gets busy and they can't. Um, think to fit in a 10 minute uh, movement meditation, what it is. So, right. Yeah. It, well, that's so true because it, it's 
health is one of those important aspects, especially when you think of you're creating these online campaigns. You could be sitting still at your computer for eight hours working on something, but we forget that you have to take care of your body because you look at how many people there end up being unhealthy. Like, my business is flourishing, but you look at their health and wondering, but you look like you're about to keel over. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, it, it's a great way that you set up the, the challenge. You kept it simple. You just took the action on it of, of driving people to that landing page, getting them into that Facebook group. So they they wanted to know more things about what's going on. So that's a powerful way to make things happen. Mm. So at the same time, I launched online programs with the same name. So, yeah. So whatever I was addressing, I did an online program for it um, with the longer lessons inside the program. Mm. Oh, excellent. That's a really powerful thing to do. So obviously the challenges, they worked really great for attracting people to you. Once you did that, then how did you start to monetize it? Because so many people, they'll do a challenge and then it's like, okay, great. I built a community, got people on my list. And then they just kind of start smiling and waving. Yeah, so the, the short lessons I taught in the group were part of the longer lessons in the online program that they could buy. Okay. So, yeah, so I had, I've got an online program with five of the awareness through movement audio lessons in it and videos of myself as well. Okay. So then once the challenge was over, what, how many people did you end up converting over to buying the, the full blown course? Um, about uh, between two and five percent, yeah. Okay. Well, that's a great time to, a way to make those things happen. There. So once you did that, would you did you feel that the first time you did it, it was the success were you looking for? Or were you wanting more from it? No, I think I was successful because a lot of people. Um, it's, it's about 1% that the list will buy from. So I think I was doing quite well. I did also have a couple of, uh, a few sales into my full blown eight week program, which was the high end $2,000 program. So I was happy with those results over the four challenges I did. Oh, excellent. And you know, that's the key to it. It's, it's that continuous growth because I think where people sometimes they go wrong is, they do something once and then they stop. As you know, one of the things that I've read over and over you know, with people, let's say they're running webinars or things, sometimes the first time they do it, it doesn't go well. I could think of at times I'll listen to uh, different speakers, you know, people that they'll have a room with, like with over a thousand people in it now and they'll describe their mm -hmm. first seminar that they did where they had, like, let's say five people that were like let's say 12 people in there five people that you know, paid to come to this thing and the other, you know, five or seven people were their friends and family. It's like, come on, can you come over here to help me out? <laughs> so <laughs> it, it's always a progress that people start off small, but then they have to keep going. And mm. that's the, one of those challenges. Like when you think of dance, the first time you do something, it probably looks like a, a, a chicken on roller skates. <laughs> Yeah. But then it gets easier and better. Not that you necessarily want that visual of a chicken on roller skates. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I'm probably, I've been running le lessons into my community still. And I ask my community, you know, what do they want to work on this week or for this month? And that's how I run it now. Um, but I've got a longer term gain as well, because Feldenkrais is relatively unknown. When I started my practice, my goal was to make it a household name. So that's my longer term goal. So the more people that have touch points with me and with Feldenkrais, the better, because the more people are going to have some idea of what that modality is. Right. Oh, exactly. Mm. So now, of course, in this process, you've been doing it as a single parent and one of the things that I hear from people is, unfortunately, a series of excuses. Um, you know, things like, oh, you don't understand, I don't have the time, and blah, blah, blah. You know, those, those different things. 
yet you know, we all have the same 24 hours every single day. I've yet to meet one person that says, no, I have 25. I'm waiting to meet that person. <laughs> but otherwise, how have you been able to manage creating this business while also raising a family by yourself? Because I think so many people, they struggle with that one thing. <laughs> um, having clear boundaries and knowing what to focus on when, <laughs> knowing how much time I'm going to actually have to focus on my business and still spend enough time with my boys. So one, one time is after school, I don't touch my computer or my phone and we have quality time together. And so then I can focus wholly and solely on the business when I've got that time. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, that's <laughs> important because if when you have those boundaries there, I think this is where people go wrong, and I see it in various aspects of life that uh, where people they're they're not focused, where they they don't really have that family time. It's like where it's just oh we're working right now instead of how do you involve your children in the work if they're at an age where it makes sense or you you create that dedicated time like this is when work stops this is when you want to be there because obviously you know children are only children once it's not like you can turn back the clock once you're like okay we're going to go back in time to when you're in five because i'm in a much better position now so we can do these things it doesn't really work that way <laughs> no and we make sure we have quality time together. So at the moment, we're focused on learning our acro yoga skills. <laughs> mm -hmm. Interesting. So, uh, do you know so that acro yoga? Fl <laughs> I've heard of it. Yeah, so I could see it now. Like, like we we're going flying through the air. Like that's not how it's supposed to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we we practice our um, circus skills and do some yoga together. And yeah building a little performance <laughs> as a family. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, so we should see the circus performance coming to a theater near you soon. <laughs> Absolutely. Maybe a street theater. <laughs> <laughs> hey, a theater is a theater, not judging anything, you know. It's... <laughs> but my youngest is so adorable. He's de I need to get him working because, you know, <laughs> he'll make money just from his cuteness. <laughs> Uh, the cuteness factor, like those things that you can be able to use your whole life to your advantage. And some people, it's kind of like, yeah, you've got to work on other skills. <laughs> <laughs> and he's so intelligent as well. So I'm sure he's going to win the crowd over if we do ever get a performance together. <laughs> ah, well, that's the beautiful thing. When you look at platforms like Facebook, you can use Facebook Live. You want that performance? Ta-da, instant audience. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> Because You've you just given me an idea videos... for my next live stream. <laughs> well, they can think about it for a moment. What are the things that people love to watch most? It comes out to three things. Kittens, puppies, and children. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> if you get all three of them in one picture, well, you're doing good because that's like herding cats, literally. But... <laughs> it's like herding cats. Love it. <laughs> Although... Otherwise, like it's something that catches on because people go, oh my gosh, this makes total sense because people love being entertained. Like the, you know, yesterday evening, I found this funny article, and it, it's it, this picture. You, thought, you gotta love it because this picture actually went viral. This man who was in, I think it was in Canada, was mowing his lawn. But there was a tornado in the background. He's just moving along. It's, it's the funniest thing to look like. It, uh, dude, there's a tornado in the background, yet he's, he's mowing, mowing his lawn. lawn. But, but and of course, they talk about it. But the thing was, the tornado was a lot further away than it looks in the picture. Because in the picture, you think, like, uh, that's like the next block over. But it's yeah. really far away. But it, it's still the one of those funny things to look at of how people gravitate towards things that are visual because it tells a story that that people look at it and they make all sorts of things i'm looking my comment was don't let anything get in the way between you and your goals not even a tornado <laughs> <laughs> because that was my interpretation but you look at social media because of the world we live in people are captivated by images that are intriguing that tell a story okay can i tell you my um viral video last year then 
Well, yes, it's I'm not, all ears. If you're interested in, so there I was running my Feldenkrais challenges and putting all these opt-ins out and doing a few live streams, but it took a 22 second video of me rolling on the floor that went viral and had over 300,000 views on it. <laughs> oh, I'm rolling wow. on the floor for 20 seconds. <laughs> Wait, so you were just rolling on the floor? I'm and rolling on the floor, yes. <laughs> there was nothing else, going wee, rolling around, that was it? <laughs> no. Actually, the first person that's rolling was my Feldenkrais practitioner. And you can tell uh -huh. it's this older man with gray hair and he's rolling pretty fast. And then at the 10, 11 second mark, it um, cuts to me. I start out a little bit slow and then I roll really fast and then I turn around and roll the other way. So this is a 22 second video. Guess how long people watched up to? <laughs> 10 21 seconds. seconds? 10 seconds when after yeah. they see this, my Feldenkrais practitioner rolling fast and then it cuts to me rolling a little bit slow. So obviously they're just like, eh, <laughs> I've seen him roll fast. That's enough. That's how long our uh, brain span is at the moment. <laughs> right. But that is an uh, important thing that you talk about because in the first 10 seconds, that's the moment we have to captivate people. Mm -hmm. But you look at how many times People spend it seeing all sorts of stuff instead of just jumping there. Hey, you're going to learn X, Y, Z. I'm going to show you this or whatever. <laughs> Where you kind of go into, good morning. My name is so-and-so. Today, well, you've already lost everybody. Exactly. Everyone's like, eh, asleep. <laughs> I like to start right. my, um, I've just started my YouTube channel. So I like to start with a question at the start of my um, videos. So it gets people right. thinking straight away. Back to that critical thinking, I guess. <laughs> well, yes, you have to do that because if you don't create engagement from the first moment of interaction, you're going to lose people because you have to remember you're competing with so many other forms of engagement out there that you have that one shot to capture their attention. If you don't do it, they're not going to watch anything else. You could have the most amazing piece of content that's life changing. It's going to rock their world. Yet they're like, eh, didn't care about the first five seconds or 10 seconds. Mm. I'm not watching anything else. So mm -hmm. they stop. Yes, exactly. You need to have a structure for your content. That's for sure. And you can't open with your name. People don't care who you are. <laughs> they care about, right. well, who, how does this person help me? then they might care about who you are. <laughs> right. It, it all goes back down to, it, if you've ever read the book by Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People, everyone's favorite subject is themselves, period. Exactly. <laughs> that you're the sideshow in this particular case. They're the main headline. They want it to be all about them. So if you keep the focus on them, they're excited about it versus, eh, yeah, that's cool. Like, whatever. But how does it help me? <laughs> but if you start off with, like, today I'm going to show you how you could do X, Y, Z to make this impact. Sound good? Yeah. I'm well, turned off. I'm turned off people straight away online if they just start with who they are. <laughs> it's like, uh, haven't you learned yet? <laughs> Come back right. and show me what you've got after you've learned how I want to hear from you, how you can help me. <laughs> Right. I think a great way for people to grasp of how you should start it off, it, even though like I don't really like to watch TV, but this is a great way to learn it. Look at how talk show hosts start off their show. Mm -hmm. They make a statement. They ask a question. They all do it. Mm -hmm. exactly. Because they know that they have to capture right then and there at the start of the hour or however long their show is. If they don't capture that attention by stating what they're going to get in terms of a benefit by watching, they know the viewers are going to tune them out and go do something else. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So you have to captivate them from that first moment. Otherwise, forget it. It doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. So that's just one of those little caveats of things you have to do. <laughs> Yeah, I've got some it, other it, ideas for movement videos now with Feldenkrais as well, like movements that would captivate people from the start. So 
quite does it involve rolling around on the floor <laughs> that's part of it yes <laughs> The role is actually very important for your human movement. You think about it. That's one of the first movements we did. And if you can't roll now, like easily, elegantly, you've lost that move movement that you had as a baby. Mm -hmm. mm. And that's one of the first movements we did and it helps us get off the floor. And that's one of the movements that people lose as they get older, if they're not getting up and down from the floor. So I want to change right. that. <laughs> Remember, it's the bigger well, picture. I want people to know about Feldenkrais so they can get up and down from the floor when they're in their 80s and 90s and not be using excuses. Oh, that's the way my body is now. It's broken. <laughs> right now, the only thing I'm visualizing is that, that commercial from, from like ages ago, we just had that one lady saying, I've fallen and I can't get up. Yes. <laughs> uh, but when you look at it, it's creating that movement. So how do you want people to truly know what it is? What are you going to do, that strategy, that action plan, so more people know what this movement modality is that helps them? Mm. Well, continue speaking about it and showing people and sharing quality content. Mm. Well, that's always important to do. <laughs> And also so, speaking no. to them about, you know, do they want to Dowinger's hump when they're in their 80s? Do they want to be able to get up and down from the floor? Do they want to learn to surf when they've retired? Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. And I think that that's where when you have that greater purpose, you know what you want to do. It makes it so much easier to visualize what you need to be doing to get there. Because if you think about it, you know that you want you want to have the impact and it lets you know, well, what are you doing on a daily basis to reach people? And I think that's something that people to ask themselves, what did I do today to reach someone new? Mm. Yeah. Well, that's what my live streaming is about as well. So. And it's live streaming is just going to become that much more important because if you think about ultimately what live streaming is, it's, it's broadcasting. It's, you, everybody now has a medium to communicate with an audience. Where in the past, if you had to turn back the clock, you know, 20 years or, or more, the only way that you could get it in front of an audience was, you know, you had to essentially get on paid media. You had to get on TV. You had to do these things. But, oh, no, now you can build a community and be able to go live in front of them whenever you want. Exactly. The future is now. <laughs> Right. It's one of the many reasons when you look at you know, platforms such as, like, let's say, the Super Bowl or, or big other media type events, that there's many companies. They might still spend some money to have a, a, a TV commercial, but it's nowhere like they did in the past when they realized they can reach a far larger number of people in that same time frame by leveraging online marketing because they realize all the all their consumers, the people they want to sell to, they're on Facebook, they're on Twitter, they're on all the different social media platforms. So if they just put their message there, they know they're going to see it. It's going to cost them a fraction than what it would to just to create that big in commercial and then pay for the airtime. Mm, exactly. So it's, it's, that says something of volume. If major brands are utilizing social media to reach consumers because it's the most cost effective way of doing it then that entrepreneur the small business owner should be doing the same use those cues to let them know that this is the way you have to do it mm -hmm. exactly yeah Where it makes all the difference in the world yeah and that's what i tell anyone that comes in contact with me with the online marketing small businesses i'm i'm going to be focusing on studios as well dance studios and fitness studios because they do important work in the world, keeping us healthy. <laughs> right. But, you know, it's important that what you just mentioned, there, how you're focusing on the dance studios, fitness studios, and so forth, that it's not about trying to solve a problem for everybody. Because if you think of the issue that's out there, so many people, they have the mentality, my product, I can help everybody. Yeah, that doesn't work so well because you think about it. Not even Walmart helps everybody. <laughs> no. Right. 
So even if your largest brands out there, they don't have a product that everybody buys, well, guess what? That means you have to look at how do you niche down to that audience that truly knows, likes, and trusts you. Mm -hmm. Since that's where the difference will really begin to shine. And it's also working with kind of people that I know are attracted in that industry for myself. You want to work with people that inspire you. You don't want to work with people that, uh, you know, you look at your calendar and you think, oh, I've got to work with that person today. So I know people that are running dance studios and fitness studios are high performance people. They are on the go. They are similar to myself in that way. So Right. Exactly. That's what you really want to do. It makes all the difference when you can focus solely in on just those people, because that makes all the difference because you don't have to work with everybody. And the analogy I like to use people, when, when say, but why do I want to focus in on somebody? I simply say it like this. Imagine for a moment you're on a flight from New York to Sydney and by some strange stroke of luck or series of unfortunate events, depending on how you look at it, you are now stuck in the middle seat. And most people never want to be in the middle seat on any type of flight. However, you have a choice. You can either let the airline decide for you who they're going to put next to you. So you're totally rolling the dice on this one. It could work out in your favor or it could be the crappiest flight known to mankind. Mm. Or you can be very specific and tell the airline, here's my criteria of the people I want sitting next to me. And then those people show up. Mm. And what most people do in their marketing is they focus in on the first one. They just let whoever come in the front door into it versus focusing in on who are these people that need, that they want to come in their front door. Mm. Exactly. And it changes everything. Mm-hmm. You, you want to work with people that inspire you, period. Right, exactly. <laughs> if people don't inspire you, why work with them? Because well, then that's just torturing yourself. Especially as an entrepreneur, you get to choose who you get to work with as well. We're not dictated by a um, business above us making decisions. Right, mm. right. exactly. So, and as we begin wrapping things up here, what is one thing that you recommend for entrepreneurs do, to do to really grow their business and leverage online marketing? Hmm, the one thing, I guess, yeah, getting clear on how you help people. Because when you understand how you're helping them, what transformation you can offer people, then you can put that everywhere and continually be speaking that. And you know, that is powerful because you, when you're clear about your purpose and what you're doing, everything lines in place. And then the people that you want to help, they begin lining up as well because they see that in everything that you do. Exactly. So you get known for that, that thing. That's the person that helps right. with live streaming for studios. <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, I want to thank you for coming onto the podcast and sharing your wealth of wisdom and all these things. How can people connect with you and learn more about what you do? So my Facebook page is Angie Mac dot get visible online. And I'm Angie Mac on Twitter and Hopefully soon, when I hit 100 subscribers, I can turn my YouTube channel into Angie Mac as well. Because <laughs> I've only just started oh, the YouTube, but uh, yeah. Well, I am sure that's going to happen soon enough. So once again, I want to thank you for coming on to the show today. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for listening to the Big Movement Podcast today. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Now that you've surely been inspired to take your entrepreneurial career and business to the next level, you can stop by the website and get more. And if you're ready to boost your business brand, be sure to grab your free report, Seven Easy Steps to Build Your Brand Today.